Hello speeders, Demetrius Villa, president of the High Speed Rail America Club here. As some of you may know, I've been quite busy finishing off my last semester of university and involved in a ton of work. I do have a couple of new episodes and analysis based on the New Jersey transit accident and positive train control, as well as train security and right line updates. While looking for footage, I did find this one from April of 2015, where I spoke at the West Palm Beach Leadership Conference on the future of Florida and the bullet train revolution. I even took tri-rail, commuter rail, and Uber to get to the event. And of course, I was the first one there. Again, proving that this new age of transit is so much better, so much less stress than being stuck in the automobile rat race on I-95. So here's a speech, and no, I wasn't paid $250,000 by Goldman Sachs to do it. I did it for you guys to represent you and the future. Enjoy. All right, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, joining us today is Demetrius Villa. He is the uh, president of High Speed Rail of America Club. Um, I believe he uh, came up with the idea of starting the club when he was traveling up and down on Amtrak. Indeed. <laughs> and uh, I'll let you tell him the story. So let's welcome Demetrius. Uh, absolutely. Well, good. good afternoon, everybody. Now, you're not uh, that familiar with me, and I may be a little bit overdressed for the occasion, but I mean, I'm here, right? <laughs> All right, so let me just get my presentation over here because I do have a presentation. All right. So for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, again, my name is Demetrius Villa. I'm a student at Florida International University of the Honors College, and I'm also an international business major. And the reason how I got into the whole high-speed rail uh, sort of uh, scenario is that uh, I started college as uh, a mechanical engineering major. And then from there, let's see if it's working. There we go. All right. So uh, back to the story, um, how I got into a whole high-speed rail thing, um, half my family lives up in New York and New Jersey. So we take the Amtrak train to get up uh, Miami to New York because my brother, he has autism, so getting on a plane with him is, is not going to be a fun thing at all. If any of you guys have seen Rain Man, that's, that's pretty much how he gets. Um, but apparently, yeah, we do go and take the train, but getting on there from Am on Amtrak <laughs> is 32 hours, nearly, from Miami to New York. So pretty much one, uh, one year I snapped, I said enough of this, and I started looking up other train systems around in other parts of the world, uh, specifically Japan. Uh, and why Japan? Well, it was because, um, number one, they came out of a horrible war uh, after World War II. The country was completely devastated, and they remade themselves into what looks like uh, something from Tomorrowland. Um, but let's go on for the presentation. It's um, a future... Uh, perspective of what America could look like from someone of this generation. So let's just start from what it is of the way of thinking that we have now today in this country. Uh, we put it down to like two different ways of thinking when it comes to infrastructure. The first one is the casino state of mind, where it's pretty much says, well, it worked before, so just throw some more money into it. And Miami-Dade is notorious for doing something like that. Um, right now they're doing more construction again on I-95 and there's been more construction on I-95 and the whole entire corridor all the way up to the Northeast. But a different state of mind that we looked up is something that's called the chess state of mind that says, okay, um, if you guys have played chess, um, the whole objective is of course to checkmate the king. So you kind of have to think moves ahead. You have to think more in the long term rather than in the short term of a casino state of mind. So the chess state of mind you're thinking is like, okay, what are the objectives and what do we have to do in order to get there? Now you can use this sort of scenario, anything out from high speed rail, but this really comes into the whole aspect of high speed rail, and I'm sure you guys have heard all aboard Florida and Tri-Rail speak today, um, of thinking more into a long term sort of thinking. So what the future may look like, um, Everyone's getting older. I mean, that's the, the fact we can't really deny. Um, people are going to go in. There's going to be new, newer generations. And I kind of represent the whole generation, genera uh, generation X and Generation Y, the Millennials. So a uh, couple of things that the Millennials are doing, they're skipping the car. Um, it used to be back in the 50s where the car used to be the king. And back in the day, everyone used to live in the suburbs and used to have everyone going into the car. And then that's where you have Bob Met Sally in the back of the car. That's how that sort of thing happened. But no one's doing that anymore. Now the, the millennials are like skipping that. They're either taking uh, public transportation, they're staying at home, or they're overworked. So they not really don't have any time for that. Uh, apart from that, the more environmentally conscious 
uh, it could be a good thing, a bad thing. When I think green, I think more of uh, what's in my pocket rather than what's in the air. But I'm good with that. And it's good also to have trees and that sort of stuff around thinking more environmentally conscious. Another thing we're doing is social media driven. This sort of things have kind of uh, run our lives now. And when you go into trains, you know, it's a lot easier to use that sort of thing. And going into the car, I mean, every time you drive on I-95, there's always someone going like this half the time going 70 miles an hour. And that's the last type of person you want to get next to at all. Uh, another thing is they're more productive through technology also too as well. There's a heck of a lot more startups coming up now that you see uh, things like Microsoft and Apple. Those, those startup things are now just accelerating. You have more companies that are starting like that now, like specifically like Instagram, stuff like that. It's more of a knowledge worker based sort of thing rather than a manual worker sort of world that we're in. So what the future may look like, um, this is from America 2050, they're another nonprofit organization based in the United States, and what they put in is the mega regions of what the US may look like. Specifically, you have the, the Northeast, of course, you have the Great Lake region, you have the Texas Triangle, California, and of course, Florida gets its own mega region here. And this is extremely important because, of course, West Palm Beach and all the rest of South Florida is concentrated in this huge, giant circle over here. So we are a mega region for sure. But how you can take this map later on is where can you put high speed rail into? So now you see the sort of connections that now you can get from the rest of the country and how those mega regions can connect within. So it's extremely important to see that now in the future, how you're gonna connect within these mega regions and how these mega regions will connect within. So, we also have to keep in mind, like this is what a city of the future may look like. Um, it's called Binge Denmark. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how you pronounce that in Scandinavia. Maybe Binge, Binge, I have no clue. But anyway, um, this city that they're building, um, they started with the train station first. So the train station is technically the heart of the city. Now, I mean, you can even see there's a Starbucks over there in the lower left city of the corner. So I mean, of course they thought of that. There's more of a environmentally green conscious and you probably see one little road over here. Now we do have to keep in mind that there is sort of an adaptation from here. We can't just take whatever Japan has done or whatever Europe has done, throw it into here to the United States and think it's gonna work because that doesn't work. Uh, I mean, car culture is gonna be here to stay and trust me, I do love automobiles. I went to college to learn for automobile design and my dream garage is a black and white Bugatti Veyron. So uh, I don't want car culture to disappear. I'll be the first one crying about it, but we do need to start putting more into uh, an adaptation going into high-speed rails and opening up more of a channel for transportation back and forth between their um, different city centers. So three questions that people ask in mind, uh, especially millennials and everyone else with high-speed rail is it number one, connectivity, convenience, and sustainability. Those are the three. And when it comes to connectivity, they're going to ask, okay, will it take me to where I want to go? Now, as any of you have seen, uh, like for example, I'll take Grand Central Station, for example, in New York City. There's a reason why it's called Grand Central Station, and it's because it's in the middle of Manhattan. So sort of these train stations kind of act as like the heart of a city. I mean, you're not gonna take someone's heart and throw it outside their body and say, okay, maybe that person will work. Um, doesn't actually work like that. So for example, if you've seen, um, even over here, all over um, the east coast of Florida, when Flagler built his railroad over here, all the train stations were the center of the city, including Miami, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, the centers moved out from there, from the train station. So we were created because of that. Uh, number two is convenience. Is it cost effective, is it time efficient? For example, if all aboard Florida, it's supposed to be two hours and 45 minutes to get from Miami to Orlando and less from West Palm Beach over to Orlando. So they're gonna, people are gonna take this, okay, versus a car, versus a plane, is it gonna be more convenient? And most of the time between uh, from 300 miles to 600 miles is a sweet spot for where high-speed rail can work. And even some people from there, they may take high-speed rail to go across um, up and down the East Coast, sort of like me, and some people may want to take uh, trains across the country. Because there, there is a market for that, but the biggest market is from getting from one place to another versus a car or a plane. And number three is sustainability. Does this financially and environmentally support my environment around me? So when millennials ask that question, they're gonna say, okay, um, does this train actually make money? 
Because I mean, you can't have a business if it's not making money. And these two, uh, these train companies do actually work as companies that have to do earn a profit. And especially like in Germany and Japan, those companies are among the largest companies within their respective countries. And also it has, it has to support the environment also too as well because you can have a train that's blowing up um, flamethrowers off the side of it and burning trees all over. So it's gonna have to be a train that actually does save the environment, saves cost, time, money, all that, and electricity. So the two largest projects we're seeing in South Florida right now are All Aboard Florida, which is gonna connect the largest points um, in South Florida, including West Palm Beach and Orlando all the way down there. And that's supposed to be completed in 2017. And um, according to uh, the, the, Florida, uh, the Federal Railroad Administration, doesn't exactly count as high-speed rail because the top speed of all aboard Florida trains are 125 miles an hour. So it's kind of on the precipice of high-speed rail, but it's there. Higher speed rail, that's apparently what we call it. We don't even have high-speed rail. We're already telling people what's higher and higher speed rail. Um, talk about that. But this is the first true steps towards high-speed rail in the country. And there's other projects that are also going around the country also as well, being in Texas and California. The other thing that also goes with high-speed rail is that these um, feeder systems that move people within the, the city regions and stuff like that. For example, Tri-Rail, which is going to connect the in-betweens, um, now opening up on US-1 as well with the expansion of All Aboard Florida opening up a station in uh, downtown Miami. So it's gonna reduce traffic and a lot of stress within the US-1. So that's gonna be more people moving in back and forth. And that's gonna introduce something which the High Speed Rail America calls a uh, train lifestyle. So what exactly is a train lifestyle? Um, it's not something that we can really see here in America anymore since we kind of killed off trains, but you can see it in the Northeast Corridor and you can sort of see it in California, as well as other places in the world like in Japan and Germany. And pretty much what a train lifestyle is that, okay, you go and take a train to work, you walk over to the subway station, the metro station, whichever, you get on the train and you go to work and you take that to come back. Now, if you're gonna take a vacation, you go and take a high-speed train to vacation, and et cetera, et cetera, it goes on and on. So you do use trains for most of your life, and what it means is that the trains, that you're not centered into, uh, how would you say it? Like pretty much your life, and the train center around of your life. You're not centered around because of transportation. You're not um, shackled down because of what the transportation you're using to a car. Just now the trains are working for you instead. <coughs> also productivity and all that sort of stuff increases within a train. Um, I did take tri-rail all the way up from um, Miami over to here and I was able to get a heck of a lot of work done because I do have a lot of tests and I mean finals are coming up so I mean that's a great time to go and take that all out of here. I probably wouldn't be able to do that in a car um, as well. <laughs> so projections for high speed rail, what's, the, what's it gonna be afterwards once it starts becoming implemented? Um, high speed rail, we are predicting that it will be one of the top largest industries in the United States within 15 years. And that is um, immense because uh, like I said, uh, rail companies are usually the largest uh, companies in their countries, for example, in Japan, um, the Japanese East Railway Company is the top five, is in the, I think it is number, yeah, number five of the largest companies in there. That's including Sony and Canon and all those other Japanese companies that we tend to associate with. Uh, another thing is the increase in blue collar jobs. Uh, if you guys have seen pictures of Detroit, it's kind of dead. So, I mean, what, what happens with that now? Um, instead of being, a place to make cars, Detroit could probably be a place to make trains, which it used to be a long time ago and there was other places within the country that used to make trains. So now you have an increase in blue collar jobs. So that's bringing in that back along with what we have with the knowledge workers also too as well. Commerce also increases within the country because now you have people moving back and forth, especially within um, other mega regions. Like for example, someone can come down from Orlando and they say they want to take a cruise in Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, and they can certainly do that. And maybe they'll end up right over here and take a, go on their yacht, and they don't even have to be close to here to West Palm Beach. They can be up in Orlando. So that opens that up. And also delays and all that sort of stuff will decrease along mega regions and also with, um, between them as well. So I-95 will see less of uh, traffic. So if some people, yeah, they may want to still take a car. That's fine. 
they'll be able to do it without, without less cars on there, so it'll be better for them. So since we are in West Palm Beach, let's we can take it now. It's going to be right and in West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach is sort of the gateway. Well, it is the gateway to South Florida. So when people are coming into South Florida, this is the first thing they see is West Palm Beach. So it's a major attraction for businesses historically and economically as well. Uh, it's pretty much flagless paradise and whatever was made here. So it's part of the largest growing population also too within the United States. Florida is now the third largest country. In the, I mean, sorry, third largest state in terms of population within the United States. Um, another thing also is, let me see. Oh, just one more thing. Uh, you see these trains over here? Okay, so in Texas they're building a sort of high-speed rail system as well. It's a private company that's doing it between Dallas and Houston. These are the trains that they're using, the Japanese trains, so that's a huge plus for the country. So steps to a high-speed rail America, how is it that we get to this? Connecting the whole entire country is number one, starting to connect within the mega region. So that's what we're doing right now. If in Florida, within Texas, and within California, they're connecting their biggest cities with high-speed rail. Rather than just connecting, okay, some place out in the middle of nowhere with some place out in the middle of the world. That doesn't work. Um, another thing is also, too, is connecting the other mega regions. So once Florida is now connected within itself, it can now start connecting, okay, with Atlanta, or with the rest of the Northeast Coast also, too, as well. Another thing is after that, until the end, you have the complete connection of the United States. Now you can have transcontinental trains. You can start having the whole entire East Coast connected and the whole entire West Coast connected. <coughs> Uh, this is an example of what we made of what an East Coast high-speed rail could look like that could stop along um, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and the rest of the, the East Coast also too as well, including all the way up from Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and all the way to Virginia, New York, and Boston, everything. So, all right, so anybody have any questions? Sure. This is prospective, but aren't... A lot, of, uh, a lot of states like Florida turning down funding for high-speed rail? Okay, well there's differences between the funding for high-speed rail. What we did back in 2011 where Rick Scott um, turned down the funding for a high-speed rail was because he didn't want it to, um, by any chance, if it did fail under a government-run project, then the uh, taxpayers would have to pay that back. With now what we're doing with All Aboard Florida, that's a private company that's doing it. So if they fail, it's not going to be anything towards us. It's just going to be on their fault and on their basis. The same thing as what's happening in Texas. It's a co private company that's doing it. The only place that's not a private company doing it is in California, which has become a, a entire huge controversy between um, the taxpayers that now have to put in $68 billion to make a project that could be done for a heck of a lot cheaper. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, we'll take the last question. Right. In sure. the business model, what's the ratio of the business traveler versus the pleasure traveler and with businesses cutting back and now using more video conferencing, air flights are down because of the, you know, the business m model being more economically based. Right. What do you see in terms of ridership? Uh, in terms of ridership, there's been a couple of studies that has been done. It's about like 30% of people that are business travelers that are using it. Um, it's about in thirds. It'll be like a third of people that are using it for travel, a third of people that are using it for business, and another third of people that are using it for, you know, just getting from one place to another. Uh, it depends on the country also too as well and the, the differences of where it's going to be. But most likely here in Florida, it will be mostly used for tourists that are from outside of Florida or within Florida also too as well. I think we heard that today. <laughs> yeah. All right, on behalf of the class of 2015, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's give a, uh, a warm class of 2015.